Lessons After the Advent. That's also where you can find an array of video recordings of previous Tabula Poetica talks and readings. We also encourage you to follow Tab Journal on Facebook and on Twitter. Today, we've invited students and classes reading the work of the visiting poets to participate via Zoom so that they can post questions and comments in the chat and participate in the Q&A portions of these events. We ask that the students on Zoom keep their microphones muted while the poet is speaking. And if you have questions as you go along, just put them in the chat and we'll be monitoring that for the Q&A at the end. This fall, Tabula Poetica is hosting three visiting poets. Today, of course, October 19th and November 9th. So mark your calendars. Plus, we finish up in December with a reading by Chapman University's own emerging poets. Genevieve Kaplan has done an amazing job as the guest curator of this year's series, and I personally am deeply grateful for the work she's doing to bring these particular poets into our ongoing conversation about all things poetry. Most of the support, both for the visiting poets and for Tab Journal, comes from the English department, and this year for Tab Journal from a special faculty opportunity funding grant. I especially want to thank our department chair, Joanna Levin, our administrative assistants, Kristen Laxo and Samantha Della O, and graduate assistant, Jason Thornberry. And I'll just add that Samantha joined Chapman right before the pandemic. And I, I don't think she knew what she was getting into and she's been fantastic figuring out the options for how we can bring Tabula Poetica, not only to our own community, but also more widely. This year, Tabula Poetica received grants from poets and writers to support our visiting poets. While in-person gatherings around poetry have long fostered a sense of community here at Chapman University, we're kind of excited to invite poetry readers from everywhere into this fall's Tabula Poetica conversation. I also want to mention that when you attend these literary events, I encourage you to actually buy the book. So here's, here's Michelle's book. And if you have an indie bookstore near you, I would suggest ordering from them or perhaps bookshop.org. Um, but when you're attending these free events online, I, I highly encourage you to actually click and buy the book. I will now hand this over to my amazing colleague, colleague in poetry, Logan Estale. And Logan, I think you need to unmute yourself. Thank you. <laughs> you're, you're, yeah, what would I do without you? Thank you, Anna. All right. Uh, although we are distanced, I am thrilled that the Fall Poetry Series, now more than a decade old and led by Professor Anna Leahy, I am thrilled that our tradition of welcoming visiting poets continues. So yeah, my name is Logan Esdale and I teach in the English department here at Chapman University. I wanna speak a little bit to our visiting poets work and to my class, English 252. We use poetry for our own purposes, to catch and release, to find what we need in an old poetic form, to relate where we've been to who we are to remember an act of making something, a photograph, a child, a name. The poems of Michelle Britton Rosado assemble musically within and among themselves. As I read her poem, Ambivalence, for instance, my ear catches words with strange and interesting doublings like name and vein, or vile and navel. Her poem's lines compose themselves with a lightness, and with each reading, certain words float off the page and become their own poems. With just a few words, 
from ambivalence, I can piece together a story about ancestry and bloodlines, what carried us and what we carry. The vein is a vial and a vial is a navel. And in that navel, in that blood, in the bloodline are names, the names and lives of our family. We use poetry to repurpose what is ours and not ours, or as Rosado says about the speaker in her poems, the I, she says that the word I is a meeting place for readers. The I invites our reading toward familiarity. Rosado is from, as I understand it, Northern California originally, and has lived in Southern California for a while now. In 2019, she completed a PhD in creative writing and literature at USC. The year before, in 2018, she published her first book length collection of poems, Why Can't It Be Tenderness from the University of Wisconsin Press. And alongside her creative work, she is studying the history of the Pantoon, a poetic form known for its quatrains and repeating lines. As her scholarship tells us, the Pantoon was popular in Malaysian literature long before appearing in Europe in the 19th century. On behalf of Chapman, the English department, Tabula Poetica, and my English 252 class, I would like to welcome Michelle Britton Lozada. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Thank you for the virtual hand clap um, emojis that I can see on the screen. Um, good afternoon. Thanks to all of you for being here. Um, thank you for the invitation to be part of Tabula Poetica um, from Viv and all of you who've been um, putting this work together. I can't imagine all the effort of putting a series like this um, into the virtual realm. Um, so I'm excited to be in community with you all and to see all your faces um, for those of you on Zoom and a virtual wave to everyone joining through YouTube. So um, before I start, I guess I should get my, I have a slideshow. So if I have the permissions to share my screen, I'll go ahead and looks like it's working. Um, and I'll share this here. Hopefully you can still see me. And there we go. I can see it and you, looks good. Great, wonderful. So the title of my talk, as you can see, is Poetry as Fieldwork, Anthropology and Writing with and Without Others. So I put that out in parentheses to kind of show that you can read it both ways. And um, I wanted to give some background regarding what brought me to the topic of this talk. And I've been giving a lot of thought to my beginnings in studying anthropology, actually. Um, I did not major in English as an undergraduate. Um, I've been thinking about how studying anthropology has influenced me as a poet, including now during the pandemic. So. When I was um, invited to give this talk and the poetry reading that will follow this evening, I went back into my email inbox and it was April 17th. So um, to kind of orient us to what life was like six months ago, um, there was some hope that this might happen in person, but we knew that it might be virtual. And so over the months, I was thinking about my plans for this and I, my plans seemed to exist in these two realms. I was imagining maybe we would be in a quasi normal world and I would just share my previous usual obsessions with poetry or maybe we would be in some uncertain future and I didn't know what my relationships to those topics would be. Um, and then as the pandemic continued and the cases rose, um, the Black Lives Matter movement gained more exposure. Um, so much of our lives are transforming internally and externally. Um, I, saw, I found myself wanting to go further back into my poetic impulses and underneath all of my intellectually curious lines of inquiry, I realized um, I was really wanting to spend time with 
um, how my poetic life developed and to the root of what brought me to poetry. So my next slide is kind of a map of the things I wanted to talk about. So um, I took a non-linear route to poetry, I think. There's no formula for how many of us arrive here. It just happens, I think. Um, but for a long time, creative writing was precisely the path I had been told throughout my adolescence and young adulthood um, not to um, not to follow because it wasn't very practical. Um, and I ended up, that was the, what I had been told. Um, and I, I ended up studying sociology and anthropology, which are not exactly big money-making fields either, but seemed at the time to me to have more real world applications. But I loved poetry and um, I started writing poetry when I was 13 really bad poems. None of them are in my book. Um, and But I kept writing as I studied anthropology as an undergraduate. And I found that the concept of symbols from anthropology and then metaphor from poetry formed this connective tissue between the two disciplines for me. So then after my BA, I did study, I did end up going for creative writing in graduate school for my MFA and my PhD. This was after a social work internship that revealed to me that I wanted to change my career and go into teaching and academia. Um, but this foundation in anthropology infused my approach to poetry and still does. So uh, my work has always been, I think, a study of human beings, even when it's based loosely on autobiography. And I'm thinking about a study of the self in a larger context of culture. So now that we're in a time of profound physical disconnection, I'm returning to these elemental ingredients of my own poem making and thinking about whether for me, my former approach to poetry is even possible in the current times. And in that introduction, um, we, um, Logan had mentioned the, the making of the poem and that's something that I'm thinking about, like how to make poems now, what does that mean now? So um, I've arrived at the feeling that new roots are needed for people to find each other. And some of the poetic tools I find myself reaching for these days are form, repetition, and erasure, as well as new considerations of space and relation. So throughout uh, middle school and high school, for me, um, poetry seemed more like myth than something that living people actually participated in. Um, at 13, I literally imagined all poets were dead um, and that there were no poets left because every poet we read in middle school and then high school was, was dead. And I think I might need to switch to headphones. Is there some background noise that is coming through in the live stream at all? No, okay. Um, so I have some neighbors that are making some noise in their backyard, just wanted to check. Um, but yeah, so if you'd asked me back then in, in middle school, high school, um, how does a person become a poet? I would have thought it was impossible or um, only a hobby. So, okay, and I got a message, it, it sounds fine. Awesome, I'm so glad. So uh, yeah, I, I thought there, there were no poets writing poetry <laughs> anymore, but it was the 90s when I was a teenager and I discovered that at least people on the internet were writing poems and that allowed me to hold on until I got to college. Um, that told me that I could write poems, but I never saw it as a path that one could actually dedicate themselves to until I got to college. But the poetry classes, I took as an undergraduate were electives and I strategically snuck them into my schedule because of that major in another field. And I had been told, um, you know, not to major in English, um, even though I don't believe that that would have been a waste now. But for someone of my background who had this fortune to go to college when neither of my parents had degrees but had worked hard to get me there, and from a community that has a significant number of military families, and children who would also enlist, um, college really seemed like this privilege that shouldn't be like quote unquote wasted. And um, to use it for purely intellectual or even creative purposes seemed wrong. So 
um, I thought a, college was just to get a practical career in social mobility. So then I took this, this detour and I shoved to the side uh, a little bit my love of reading literature and writing poems. And I found in, the, my, in my first semester of college that the fields of sociology and anthropology, which at my small school were, in, were housed together in one department, um, those two fields gave me an opportunity to think about the conditions of people's lives, which is what I loved about literature. I wanted to understand why we are born into different circumstances and how that shapes us and our emotional lives. The social sciences gave me language to name these different aspects of human experience, culture, race, gender, sexuality, class, and so I rationalized this choice of major as something that could prepare me for law or social work or public policy, though really I was more interested in the ideas and the theories. Um, so as a writer or a wannabe writer, I appreciated at the time how the soft sciences blurred the lines between objectivity and subjectivity. And um, I was fortunate to read exciting postmodern works that were experimental and made use of first person. Um, ethnography, um, which is a written study of a culture or group um, and usually involves long-term field work and qualitative research was really appealing to me because it felt so close to storytelling, though with some sense of verisimilitude and there were methods involved and specialized vocabulary. And, sorry, just one minute here. And so from anthropology, I learned about symbolic anthropology in particular, and that gave me new ways to think about symbolism in literature and poetry. And um, I found a lot of parallels between the school of anthropology and then poetry as a genre that largely depends on metaphor and how both allow for modes of interpretation and deeper meaning. So um, Clifford Geertz is probably um, one of the most famous symbolic anthropologists. And he wrote in his book, The Interpretation of Cultures, and I have to say like apologies for all the masculine pronouns here. Um, but his quote is, uh, believing that man is an, an animal suspended in webs of significance, he himself has spun. I take culture to be those webs and the analysis of it to be therefore an interpretive one in search of meaning. And so essentially, he and other symbolic anthropologists believe that culture is made by humans through symbols. And as an anthropologist, his work is to understand the symbols of a culture. Um, his fam famous piece is Notes on a Balinese Cockfight, um, in which cockfighting becomes this symbol that he interrogates as a key to understanding Balinese culture. Another um, symbolic anthropologist that I read as an undergrad uh, was Mary Douglas. She wrote Purity and Danger, and she theorized that the body was a symbol for the culture. And she wrote about taboos, like for instance, forbidden foods, if you're in a culture where you're not allowed to eat certain things, um, that that was a way to control what enters the individual body. And that became a metaphor for the larger culture. So I was really drawn to this, to this school of anthropology. And so I wanted to um, kind of point out how also like the works by these symbolic anthropologists, like I was kind of reading them as these long extended poems, like they were just these extended metaphors that were written in prose and it was wonderful. I felt like I had found a loophole <laughs> as a declared anthropology major and a secret poem writer. Um, so then metaphor to kind of connect these two ideas um, I took this definition from the New Princeton Encyclopedia of Poetry and Poetics, a metaphor being a trope or figurative expression in which a word or phrase is shifted from its normal uses to a context where it evokes new meanings. And um, I was thinking how like, even though these ideas aren't the same, of course, a symbol is not a metaphor and a metaphor is not necessarily a symbol, but they both involve this surface impression 
And then there's an interpretation and they suggest that life is layered and complex and that it's not always literal. So these two ideas, um, symbol and metaphor became intertwined for me. So then what this looked like as a student is I would be in my sociology and anthropology classes and this was before laptops were really common. So I'd be handwriting my notes and I would have these like poems in the right column of my note. You know, I'd have some key term we were supposed to learn like cultural relativism. And then I'd be writing a poem about cultural relativism on the right hand side. And then I would get to my poetry classes and I'd be weaving in these concepts that I, were, I was learning in my other classes like immigration, diaspora, uh, post-coloniality, working class identity, being mixed race. So there was a lot of cross-pollination for me. If, um, if you read my book, um, you may have noticed water is a symbol and metaphor throughout. It's kind of implied in the cover too, which is a bit abstract, but um, it's like a kind of a watermark image. Um, I've lived in relative proximity to the Pacific Ocean all my life. I was born in San Francisco and as a child looking across the bay and then further west, I would try to squint. I remember doing this, like trying to squint and seeing Malaysia. Um, of course, I wasn't seeing it, but I was trying to see it. And that's where my, my mother's um, side of the family lives. And so water, I thought of it as this, like, it's a vast borderland, but it's also a channel and a way, um, you know, a path that our plane would take, you know, when we would go on, on visits back. It was connection, but it was also separation. It was emotion, it was uncertainty, it was ancestral, like the water held a lot of meaning for me. And so all this is to say that poetry for me is deeply about metaphor and symbol and as a way of studying people, including when I'm studying myself in a somewhat auto-ethnographic way in my poems. So I, made this three part Venn diagram. And this is what I was thinking about in my, like what are the conditions I'm used to making poems in? And as, as someone with this like anthropology sort of origins, and it, maybe it could be an interesting lens for reading anyone's work, but it's definitely a part of my process and sensibility as a writer. And I've been thinking a lot about how anyone creates anything right now because I feel like all of these things have changed. Um, I love to, for instance, people I feel like are really key to my process. I love to write in public, coffee shops especially, where I feel like a poem would be influenced by the people around me, the things that I would see, the things that I would hear. Like I was a participant observer in the field, like with that sort of anthropologist hat on. So then when the pandemic closed up all my favorite writing spots and the orbits that I would find myself, you know, amongst other regulars, um, I felt like, you know, this part of the creative process had really been closed off um, to me. And I wondered like, what could my poetic life be like in social isolation as someone who really wants people to be part of that process? And then even the symbolic and metaphorical significance of objects and behaviors have changed. So in many ways have changed, um, not all of them, <laughs> not life isn't completely uh, um, unrecognizable, but I still feel like I'm recalibrating my relationship to so many things in my writing, how we move our bodies through space, how we may or may not make eye contact with people, how many voices we might hear in a day that aren't mediated by technology. Um, the way I purchase food, like everything in my day-to-day -day life that would often be the material for my poems, I'm now having to think through these other lenses. And um, these symbols and meanings are in flux. And so the anthropologist in me is still in that participant observer mode. Like I don't feel like she's ready to report back from the field yet but it's also a, a delight to be reconnected to this knowledge that I don't think I was really thinking of consciously anymore. And um, suddenly they're right here at the, at the surface of my writing. So um, the shape of poems in a time of disconnection for me right now, um, I would say like before 
uh, you know, most of my poems from my book are written in free verse. I would say they're, they're probably lyric poems. They're shorter, not usually narrative. Um, not too many in a received form, like a sonnet, though I do have the occasional pantoum. I do have some rhyming and um, sounds may echo. But for me right now, like free verse and lyric poetry almost feel impossible. I find myself thinking about creative constraints instead. So uh, right now I'm thinking a lot more about form and repetition, even erasure just feels like the waters that we're swimming in. So for instance, um, I don't leave the house much, but I've been thinking about the, my new routines and observing those and watching those and seeing if maybe a poem in repetition wants to surface or if something wants to fit in a form like a pantoum or a sonnet. I wanna put this current experience in like a vessel. That's what I feel creatively compelled to do right now. So um, how to carve new roots to each other. Um, so even though I'm not writing a lot, admittedly, um, it still feels like a really poetically rich time because I'm learning to see the world differently, to relate to others differently. So the poems in me are still finding their new registers, their new languages, new arrangements of space on the page. So I find myself translating the old into the new, like my yard now feels like a city <laughs> to me. Um, the sidewalks are my coffee shop. Instead of getting to eavesdrop on conversations in a public space where, you know, someone might be talking about their grandmother, you know, and then that becomes a poem prompt for me. And then I start to write a poem about a grandmother. So instead of getting to get that kind of stimuli that I'm used to, I find myself listening to things like the ticking of a neighbor's water sprinkler or noticing on my evening walks, the same news broadcast illuminating all the living room windows on my block up and down the street. So it just seems like the volume and saturation of everything is softer. And um, this pandemic is teaching me that uh, writing is as much sensory input as it is output. And that the process of making a poem can take place long before we write or type a single word. So um, that kind of concludes the prepared stuff that I, I brought for today, but hopefully these are some threads that we could continue in the, in the Q&A. All right, we'll let you unshare your screen there. Great. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat, but I want to encourage the students especially to put some more questions in the chat. Uh, I was struck by your discussion about uh, being an anthropology major and that sociology and anthropology were combined where you went to undergrad. The same was the case for my undergrad and I, I was two courses short of a SOAN major. Um, so I, I think I, I, I get what you're saying, and I like this idea of the participant observer, the poet as participant observer. Um, we have one student who has asked about the difference between sociology and anthropology, and maybe if you could tease the, the two different perspectives apart a little bit. Um, uh, that student also says, why study one over the other and what value um, do they have together or in opposition? And, uh, and as a tag on question, uh, that same student asks if you need a college education to be a proper poet. Oh, wow, those are great questions. <laughs> so at my school doing the, our, our department was actually called comparative sociology, which I thought was interesting. So this idea that you could compare how societies worked um, here in the US, but also look outside of the US and that there could be this sort of comparative global um, understanding of sociology. So there was a lot of overlap at my school and I don't think that they were really harsh about like drawing that line, but we did have to pick a concentration. And if I could have done both, and in a way, I think I might have satisfied the requirements for both. Um, we, mainly the difference at my school was whether you did quantitative or qualitative research. 
So quantitative research is like statistics, or you think about sociologists who study, um, you know, like recidivism rates, like re, um, re-offenders in criminology, or, you know, people who are from a certain income bracket, the percentage likelihood of this or that happening. Um, so a lot more like numbers based and then, but not necessarily exclusively. And that anthropology was usually qualitative, which would involve participant observation where you would record your findings um, using interviews. Um, I'm blanking, I'm having to go back like 16 years in my education to remember all the different methods. But that was like mainly the difference, but there were plenty of sociologists who also did like field work or participant observation and that there could be a lot of a lot of overlap. Um, I remember taking theory courses in both, taking anthropological theory and sociological theory, which I loved and I think also probably helped like put me in the direction of wanting to do a PhD because I loved the ideas and we were reading just these really foundational texts that influenced many fields like Darwin and Marx. So um, yeah, so I don't think there was necessarily a lot of value to study one over the other, except for me, I really loved writing and it seemed like if I focused a little bit more on the anthropology, I would get to read more ethnographies, things that were written in that mode, as opposed to a lot of charts and graphs, though I liked that stuff too. I mean, I feel like as a poet, so much of our work is mathematical also, and thinking about balance, and at least for me, I think a lot about numbers and, and what those things mean. Um, as far as the question about, do you need a college education to be a proper poet? I mean, I don't think so at all. It, I think it really depends on the person. For me, um, just what college offered was the, the freedom to be in a space, a bubble where I could just focus on that. But I think there are so many poets who have, fe who have careers that didn't necessarily have to do with, with poetry. Um, like I think often my, the example I always think of is William Carlos Williams writing poems on his prescription notepads between patients. And that's why some of his poems have these really narrow lines or can be really short. I think a, a person can write a poem anywhere in, in any, any mode of life. Okay, that, that was um, a great answer. Uh, we don't wanna discourage our students from showing up for class but um, <laughs> that's not required to write a poem. Uh, there are a couple of questions about publishing and I'm wonder, I'm gonna sort of collapse a couple of these questions. Um, can you talk a little bit about the process of not just writing a poem, but moving from, oh my gosh, I've written a poem, I'm going to share it with the world through editorially reviewed publication. How do you move from, the sort of writing of the poems to the business of the poems and and how long did it take you to actually publish this book? Um, it, is it something that you knew you were writing as you were writing the poems either from the beginning or at somewhere along the way? How did the book happen? Thank you. Uh, so well, I mean, I would say a lot of things happened for the for the book to come into fruition, and a lot of it was was being in uh, an MFA program, and I would say, and even studying um, in my my renegade sort of mode of like taking these poetry workshops that. I think there was even a course that I technically wasn't supposed to be able to take because it was an advanced workshop um, and I wasn't a major. But um, I would say that the workshop model really helped me understand that I needed other people to read my work, that I would have the poem in my mind and my, the poem unlocked this whole world of experience. And then I remember very early on in, in trying to write more poems, sharing it with other people. And it was like, they had a completely different interpretation or something that I thought was so obviously there wasn't there. Or even just logically, they'd be like, oh, well, how did the speaker get from here to over there? And I was like, 
oh, there's five years in between. And they'd say, what? So um, having other readers was really critical. And um, being in a poetry workshop was that space where I really learned audience, things that I was told in even my more like academic writing classes. Um, poetry definitely taught me audience and that I can't take it for granted that people know exactly what I'm talking about or that they can follow, that there's a certain amount that we have to reveal if we if we want the reader to have the a certain experience right so um, I would say that was was critical to developing my poetic voice and figuring out what it is that I wanted my poems to achieve and I knew for me as a writer I wanted my poems to be, I mean, I want them to be open to different kinds of readings and interpretations, but I knew that there were also certain core things that I did want to convey. And so knowing that I was that type of writer, um, that I knew I had to sort of modify my approach or, or to get in, input from others. So um, then going on to an MFA program, which I was in a three-year program. Many of them are two years. Um, I was in a three-year program and that was like, and I'm so grateful for that third year because I felt like that's where things really began to gel. And it, honestly, I don't think it, I fully understood when I applied for MFA programs that I would be writing a manuscript. Like I just knew I wanted to write poems and to study poetry and to like, maybe teach college level something to do with writing. And so then I got there and they're like, so you're going to write a thesis. And I'm like, okay, so I guess now I'm writing a book. And that was the, the basis of um, why can't it be tenderness? I would say it was like a third, a third to a half of that was my MFA thesis, which I began in 2008. So I know there was like one question about like how long it took to write the poetry book. So that's kind of folding that. And it was 10 years. It was exactly 10 years. I think that came up in my um, interview conversation with Vive that we did for Prism Review. It was like literally to the day. Like I started my MFA on August 1st, 2008. I moved to Fresno. And then it was July 31st, 2018, I think, when I, I gave the the final edits over and I was like, it's out of my hands. It's not mine <laughs> anymore. So um, yeah, and then sending individual poems for publication. Uh, I, went, I went to Fresno State for my MFA and they were very, um, they have a poetry manuscript class and a literary journal. So there was a lot of emphasis on publishing and getting your work out there. And so I was able to use my whole time there to get individual poems published that's when I started to see, really see the book coming together, seeing what poems resonated with editors and readers. And, and it was really like an exchange, I feel, um, as opposed to, I know writing is often done in isolation, but I also think it's like very deeply about exchange and collaboration with colleagues and editors and and with you all here I get a new insight into my work every time I get to share it with others so and I I think um that that relates to the previous question about you know is college necessary no but uh college does give you the workshop if you're a writer and does give that community mm -hmm. and and reference points that you can use as a writer um I'm gonna read this question straight from the chat because it's a little longer and a little more complicated and refers directly to your talk. So do you think that the softer volume and saturation of input from the world will lead to different themes and different emotions in the center of your works and and perhaps by extension to other people's works as well to the poetry that's being written now. What do you think those might be? How do you think that perhaps a new definition of what a crowd or a crowded room is? Um, and how would that affect the definition of loneliness and isolation? That question feels like a poem. I'm, I'm like still, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, how do I think the softer volume and saturation will lead to different themes and different emotions in the center of your works? You know, I feel like I'm still listening for that, um, but I did have this idea for my next book that it would be about 
um, identity, but also as uh, like an inheritance. I have a I have a young son who wasn't didn't appear in my first book because he wasn't quite born yet when I had finished that manuscript. And so he's three now. And so this the poems that followed, I was thinking a lot about um, bringing a child into the world and what do I want him to know about me and where my families come from and also the world that we're living in. And so he was born actually in the last presidential election cycle. And so I was thinking a lot too about what did I want to share about that time. And so I thought, okay, I was going to have this certain kind of book and it keeps changing along with, along with the times. Um, so like right now, I'm just, I'm thinking a lot about what it would be like to be at certain stages of one's life during this period, you know, like for him being three and not see, really seeing friends for kids his age for the better part of a year now, right? Um, thinking about my students that I work with and them being in college during this time that's usually very like social and like now we're in this other kind of format. So I don't know, um, I'm, still, I'm still thinking through what those themes, what those images might be. Um, I am thinking a lot about, which I think would probably be a through line is the natural world and geography. I mean, that's something that I, I feel like I often turn to, but now my sense of time moving is really influenced by the environment, the seasons changing, um, especially here in LA where I, even this year, I feel like I've noticed the seasons more than ever and also what's normal and what's not normal um, in a time of climate change as well. And it's rather than just being this endless summer, it's like, no, I notice things about the leaves right now that I, I might not have noticed um, before. So I don't know, maybe more of those finer details of, of living might, might make it in. Um, but I'm thinking too about this other question about the crowd, a new definition of what a crowd or crowded room is and how that would affect loneliness or isolation. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I'm, I'm excited even as a reader too, to like see more poems that are gonna have Zoom in them or you know, other things for, of, our, of our current, um, conditions so I'm, I'm also reading along with this so. yeah I'm I'm reading Zadie Smith's slim little volume of essays that were written during the pandemic and that's already published and it's interesting to see how quickly she responded in writing to the pandemic but also how much has changed even since the pandemic started and some of these essays um, the world is even more complicated and different than, than at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, I'm gonna combine a couple of questions here from the same person. So um, one of the students wants to know about revision and how often your poems were revised or are revised even still. And this is related, I think, to the the idea of the workshop and the way you talked about the workshop as pointing out things that you would not have realized on your own. So if you could talk a little bit about the workshops relation to revision and what qualities of a workshop conversation are helpful to you as a poet. Yeah. So um, it's really interesting to that's a really interesting question because now that I'm not in school anymore and I graduated from my PhD in 2019, but even then, like, if, and if, for those of you who may not be familiar, you know, PhD usually involves some years of coursework, but then you stop taking classes and then you're working on all of your requirements and the dissertation. So really my coursework finished in 2015. So then I wasn't in that cocoon of the of the workshop anymore and I had to figure out like well who are my readers now like those initial readers and um, feel very grateful to have through and I would say I, I only found these people because I went through <laughs> went through an, an MFA and then PhD but like trusted readers who I could one on do one-on-one -on -one exchanges with 
or like I have a group text with a couple poet friends right now. And sometimes we randomly share things with each other. So I would say like now I'm part of these sort of informal intermittent workshops, which now just get to be friendships, um, which is which is wonderful. So I would say, um, you know, every poem is kind of different. There are some poems that I write it and I hate it, but I want to save it. Like I know I want to do something with it. Um, and there's something in there and I can't figure it out. And I know I need somebody else to read it, to help me dig in and find the part that needs to be, you know, saved. And then maybe the rest gets trimmed away or, or I start over, but I, I keep that, that nugget. Um, sometimes I write a poem that I know is only half written and I'm trying to figure out like, what else is it supposed to say? And then I have a conversation with someone about um, like the different directions it might go in. And then sometimes I feel like I get really lucky and there's a poem that feels really done or, or close to done and I share with someone and they can be honest with me and say like, it's ready, just send it to a journal. Or they'll say like, I'm sure it was a really great idea. And I know you're really tied to this subject but I didn't get it, you know, <laughs> or, or, you know, and then, and then it's so amazing too, because I can have two poems that I feel equally sure about. And then, and then I discover, which is great because then it saves me the heartache of like, sending it off and then getting all those rejections. Right. So testing it out with, with people is, is essential to me. I think it's very rare that um, I have a poem that nobody has read and then I send it off or, or read it at a public reading. Um, yeah. And, and my husband too, sometimes I share poems with him. He's, he's mainly a fiction writer, but he has a very good critical eye. Can you talk a little bit about some of the living poets that you like to read? I, I don't like the question about favorites. <laughs> I have trouble choosing favorites myself. And, you know, today somebody might be my favorite, but three days from now I find a different favorite. So, sure. um, the, the question was about your favorite living poets, but if you could just talk a little bit about who you're reading, who, whose work you're finding especially interesting right now. Yeah, so um, I have to say, I haven't been doing as much reading as I would like, um, mainly things that are appearing in the New Yorker. <laughs> and then I'm like, what's this week's poem or poems um, or things that friends share through social media. They screenshot something on, Instagram and I'm holding the screen so I can read the whole poem. Um, so I get a lot of these sort of like recommended poems through osmosis. I've been working slowly through uh, The Galleons by Rick Barrett. Like I've just been kind of like savoring poems from that. But I would say in like the, the shuffle cause I'm also an educator of like transitioning teaching to online. I also taught through the whole summer. So it's just been kind of like nonstop um, Zoom teaching. So I've been kind of focused mainly on that, but like thinking, thinking about poems and that poetic eye. Um, but as far as like just generally some of the poets I really like, um, I would say some big influences for me were um, Natasha Trethewey, who wrote Native Guard and it won the Pulitzer Prize. For those of you who, who may not be familiar with it, she is, uh, she had served as our Nation's Poet Laureate oh, in the mid 2000s. Um, and her background is that she's from Mississippi um, and half black, half white And her book, Native Guard was about the Native Guard during the Civil War um, that was fighting on the Confederate side um, and was an all black um, guard. So she writes about history and being mixed race and place and uses a lot of forms. So that was something that really resonated with me. And she was actually the first, um, her poem incident was the first pantoum I had ever read. So uh, that was really moving. And then I felt so fortunate that one of my favorite poets was like anonymously the judge that had chosen my book for publication, Amy Nazuka Matothil. I had no idea because up until just like last year, the Brittingham and Pollock prizes, which is the prize that published my book and, and another winning book and, and some other books from that, from that year, 
they had for the longest time been anonymously judged. And so they would tell you who the past judges were. So you kind of got a sense, but you never knew what, who that year's judge would be. And had I known it was going to be Amy Mizukamatapal, I would have totally been like, oh, I'm so submitting to this. Uh, but I submitted because I liked, you know, who they'd had as judges previously and the type of work that they had published. So then when I found out that it was chosen and the, um, the publisher had told me who it was, I was just like, it was like a double, like, I don't know, best news ever because she, um, her work is very, for me in my reading of it, um, you know, very much interested in like place and location and um, also being of mixed ethnicity and like trying to write about different cultural backgrounds. And so um, those are those are a few poets that I tend to go back to. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the last two because I'm reading Amy Nezakumatado's um, what is it called? The, it's her new book of essays on the natural world. And also um, in my stack, I haven't started it yet, is Natasha Tretheway's memoir. So mm -hmm. those are also two poets that are writing nonfiction as well. Um, we have time for a couple more questions. So let's see. Uh, here's an interesting one that goes back to your talk about anthropology. Do you think that if you had never gotten into anthropology that your writing would still be the same? And do you think you would be writing poetry at all or have become a poet? So I think this goes back to, you know, did anthropology actually maybe make you a poet? And certainly how it influenced you as a poet. That's such an interesting question. I don't think I've ever asked myself what would have happened if I didn't it was, and I even remember the specific class and it wasn't, it was actually a sociology class called social problems. And it was a GE course. You couldn't even apply it to the major. So that didn't even like be, that wasn't even part of my credits for the major. Uh, but it was just like each week or two, we would look at a different social problem, but it happened to be taught by someone who had been trained in anthropology. So I fell in love with her class and then I took another class in the department and then another and then another. And I was like, I think I'm just a major now in this. But I had started out, um, I had declared communications and I thought I was going to get into journalism. So that was going to be my way to be a writer, you know, and to feel like adjacent to literature and writing. I had been the um, editor of my school's newspaper in high school. Although I mainly liked to write like the, the arts and entertainment reviews and stuff. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like I was just meant to end up in sociology and anthropology. Sometimes I wish I had done a double major in English, but then I also was really attached to the idea of minoring in a foreign language. So I minored in German and that felt like it took up the rest of my bandwidth and that there'd be no room for, for another major. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd always been really interested in language too. And so studying German was also a really cool way to think about how language is constructed and meaning is made. So um, would I still be writing poetry at all or had become a poet? Like maybe if I hadn't enrolled in that one class I don't know though. I remember afterwards, after taking that class, actually, no, even before that class, I went through, this is kind of crazy that I did this, but my school had like the schedule of classes and it was all printed back then. So we would get this like big thick book at the beginning of each semester that would have just the basic course descriptions that are used every semester. But I remember going through the whole book, which wasn't too, too thick since it was a smaller liberal arts college, but it was still considerable. I remember I highlighted every course that sounded interesting to me. <laughs> and I remember I highlighted a lot in comparative sociology. So I don't know, I think I would have still ended up there. But I don't know, maybe I, maybe I would have ended up going into to journalism. But I think in that space, I would have eventually been exposed to I don't know, poets or writers, or I would have jumped ship, I think. I think I did the same thing with my college catalog. It sat down at the beginning and highlighted. And I really miss the paper catalog because now 
as a student, you have to know what you're looking for to find it in the catalog. Whereas, you know, I, I ended up taking classes kind of randomly because of the way I had highlighted the catalog. Um, and I also think that um, studying a foreign language as a poet is really helpful in understanding the structure of the English language. And, and so I, I hope most of our students are, are, who are writers or even readers of literature are thinking about the ways that the foreign language that they may be taking may be playing into that. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, and that'll be to see if you want to share one of your poems that you've written. And that's sort of a teaser for tonight's evening reading as well, which is at 7 p.m. Pacific time. And as you're thinking about which poem to read, I'm just going to hold up the book again and encourage people to buy Why Can't It Be Tenderness? And do you have a poem that you would like to share with us to wrap up this session? Yeah, sure. I feel like because um, Logan kindly mentioned the poem Ambivalence that I might read that one aloud. And normally I wouldn't do this, but this is actually kind of the nice thing about Zoom is I can sort of show what it looks like on the page just so that people can get like a, a visual that it's this like narrow poem um, in couplets, so two line stanzas. And, um, and yeah, it's, it's titled Ambivalence. And the title is also one of those bridging titles. So it's part of the first line. So it just kind of continues. Ambivalence as manacle, joining this with that. It's maniacal, the balance. Even my name is an I am. So bail me out of my veins. One drop or the whole vial, whatever is viable. My navel, a cable over the Pacific. What I became, my own enclave. Thank you, Michelle. That was beautiful. And the, the one thing that I most miss about in-person poetry events is the cheering at the end. <laughs> so know that we are all clapping. Thank you for visiting us. We'll see you in a few hours at the poetry reading. Um, thanks again to Genevieve and Samantha and Logan. Uh, you're all fantastic colleagues. I think that's a wrap. <laughs>